from impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issues, but above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Post America. Happy Friday and welcome to First Post America, your global pit stop for the latest news and headlines from the United States and around the world. I'm Eric Ham coming to you live from the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. We'll get you a roundup of all the day's top stories, but first, let's take a look at the headlines. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu orders his troops to prepare for scenarios beyond Gaza as the threat from an Iranian strike looms large. China urges the United States to play a constructive role in the Middle East after U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken asked his Chinese counterpart to dissuade Iran from striking Israel. The United States, Japan, and South Korea stage joint military drills involving aircraft carriers just days after North Korean leader Kim Jong-un instructed his troops to prepare for war. The United Nations says gang violence has plunged the Caribbean nation of Haiti into record levels of hunger. Almost 5 million people are at risk of acute food shortage. And Russian military instructors arrive in the West African nation of Niger. Moscow sends a cargo plane full of military equipment, including air defense systems. We begin in the United States and a look at the race for the White House. Not a day goes by when Donald Trump does not spark controversy. This time, the former president has turned his ire on Jews in America. Speaking in Georgia's capital city of Atlanta, Donald Trump questioned the mental fitness of Jewish voters who support Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. The former president said, quote, any Jewish person who votes for a Democrat or votes for Biden should have their head examined. Doubling down, the ex-president went even further to say that African Americans and Jews vote for Democrats out of habit. Now, President Biden's campaign shot back at Donald Trump, calling his speech divisive and hateful. Meanwhile, Donald Trump has accused President Biden of totally abandoning Israel in response to President Biden's warning to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of withdrawing American support over Gaza. The former president has repeatedly criticized the Biden administration for failing to maintain stability in the Middle East, which Donald Trump claims was achieved during his tenure with the Abraham Accords. Now pandering to his voter base at home, Donald Trump upped the ante against President Biden, calling his economic policies a disaster. Biden has totally lost control of inflation. It's back, it's raging back. The number today was very high, very bad. It's actually much higher because they exclude various categories. It's actually much higher than that. The number is out of control. Biden has no idea what the hell he's doing. He's the worst president in the history of our country. Donald Trump also hinted at D-Day on November 5th as he repeatedly emphasized calling Election Day Christian Visibility Day. Now, the former president's largest following is among white evangelical Christians who have been voting for Donald Trump since 2016 and plan on continuing with the trend in 2024. Um, I plan to vote for Donald Trump because he seems to help our um, economics a lot more than our current president. Um, oh, okay. 
I, I tend not to be too far right leaning or too left leaning. I'm kind of in the middle, but I just agree with everything that he's done for our country um, when he was our former president. At this point, he's the only one that can make America great again. He can, On G. Yeah. <laughs> he can clean up this mess. We love his policies. We loved him before. We still love him. Now, if Donald Trump's objective is to win back the White House, aiming his racially and divisive attacks at Jewish and black voters in Georgia, no less, a state Trump absolutely needs to win in 2024, and a state that Joe Biden flipped blue in 2020 certainly is a risky strategy. But as Donald Trump continues to illustrate, he is all about risk. And staying in the United States, the FBI director has raised serious concerns about a possible attack in the U.S. Testifying before a House budget panel, FBI Chief Christopher Wray said concerns about a Moscow concert hall-like attack had escalated. But now, increasingly concerning, is the potential for a coordinated attack here in the homeland, akin to the ISIS-K attack we saw at the Russia concert hall just a couple weeks ago. We also need funding to counter the threat from the People's Republic of China, a government sparing no expense in its quest to hack, lie, cheat, and steal its way to the top as a global superpower and to undermine our democracy and our economic success. On March 22nd, armed gunmen barged into a concert hall in a Moscow suburb and opened fire. 144 people were killed in the deadliest attack in Russia in two decades. The Islamic State Khorasan claimed responsibility for the attack. Now the FBI director cited concerns over terrorism to help persuade lawmakers to boost funding for the agency, stressing that this is by no means a time to let up or dial back. U.S. officials have been worried about the possibility of an attack in response to Israel's ongoing war against Hamas in Gaza. When I sat here last year, I walked through how we were already in a heightened threat environment. Since then, we've seen the threat from foreign terrorists rise to a whole nother level after October 7th. China continues its relentless effort to steal our intellectual property and most valuable information. And that is just scratching the surface. As I look back over my career in law enforcement, I would be hard pressed to think of a time where so many threats to our public safety and national security were so elevated all at once. But that is the case as I sit here today. Now, Director Ray also pressed lawmakers to renew the surveillance program FISA, saying that it was key to help fight against terrorist attacks. The program, which expires on April 19th, permits the United States government to collect, without a warrant, communications of non-Americans located outside the country to gather foreign intelligence. It is critical in securing our nation, and we are in crunch time with our 702 authority set to expire next week. So let me be clear, failure to reauthorize 702 or gutting it with some new kind of warrant requirement would be dangerous and put Americans' lives at risk. But the FBI director is facing strong pushback from congressional Republicans. The agency has become the prime target for former President Donald Trump and his allies. And Trump has called on Congress to slash the law enforcement agency's funding, alleging it unfairly targeted him while going soft on his political enemies. Uh, I'll be honest with you, and, and this pains me to say this, but I don't trust you. Um, I, I don't think that this is necessarily a funding problem that we have for your for your agency as, as much as a leadership problem. And You know, you previously stated in a Senate hearing in December that it would be unworkable to require the government to get a warrant before collecting Americans' private communications. Yet former NSA lawyer George Croner recently estimated the warrant requirement would force the FBI to get about three warrants a day. Now, Director Ray, you've got more than 30,000 employees that work for the FBI. Are you seriously saying that three warrants a day is too much of a burden for the FBI to protect our Fourth Amendment rights? This issue is one of the most important issues. So could you please say why it's so important that we pass this and not get caught up in a Trump issue because he's mad. He authorized this law 
when he was president. So come on, not, not, let's not play the hypocrisy. Could you please tell you know, the public at this point, or us, where we are and why it's so important? So Section 702 is indispensable in keeping Americans safe from a whole barrage of fast-moving foreign threats. It is crucial to identifying terrorists in the homeland working with or inspired by a rogues gallery of foreign terrorist organizations who have publicly called for attacks against our country. It helps us find out who these terrorists are working with and what they're targeting and we made and it's what we need to stop them before they kill Americans. Now a bill to renew the program was blocked by conservative revolt on Wednesday. In fact, earlier that day, former President Donald Trump had called to kill the measure, saying the program was illegally used against him to spy on his campaign and against many others. And now to the war in Europe, where Russia and Ukraine are recalibrating their strategies by attacking each other's power grids and energy infrastructure. In fact, just last night, Russia destroyed one of the largest power plants in Ukraine, forcing a blackout in the capital of Kyiv and nearby regions. Moscow says the attack was in retaliation for Ukrainian drone attacks on two major Russian oil refineries last month. In a conversation with his Belarusian counterpart, Russian President Vladimir Putin says he chose the humanitarian path by not attacking Ukraine's power infrastructure during the winter. Unfortunately, we observed a series of strikes on our energy sites recently and were obliged to respond. I want to emphasize that even for humanitarian reasons. We did not carry out any strikes in winter. What I mean is that we didn't want to leave social institutions without power, hospitals and the like. But after a series of attacks on our power facilities, we had to respond. Now Putin says his forces will continue attacking Ukraine's energy infrastructure throughout the summer. The Russian president has called it the first phase of demilitarizing Ukraine. I will repeat it once more. If everything centers around solving the issues that we talked about initially, then the strikes on energy are linked in part with solving one of the tasks we set for ourselves, and that is demilitarization. Currently, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians are without electricity after the Russian strikes. President Volodymyr Zelensky has accused the West of turning a blind eye by delaying the deliveries of air defense systems to Kyiv. And of course, the urgent needs for Ukraine, and I think it's not only for Ukraine, for European security. The urgent needs, number one, number one, of course, is air defense. I will speak about it with all the details. Meanwhile, Kyiv's top generals say that the army is running short of troops and is at its, at its breaking point as Russia continues to send waves of soldiers into Ukraine. A senior commander claims that Russian troops outnumber his men anywhere between seven to ten times on the eastern front lines. Now, as the war grinds on, Europe has proposed peace talks in June of this year. At least 100 countries, including Ukraine, will attend the summit in Switzerland. However, Russia has not been extended an invitation. Now, Putin says that holding the peace talks without Russia is a joke and nothing short of a political circus. The idea of holding some kind of conference in Switzerland is being pushed. We are not invited there. Moreover, they believe that we have nothing to do there. But at the same time, they say that without us, it is impossible to decide anything. And since we are not going there, this is already a complete circus. Now, the war between Russia and Ukraine has impacted millions in Europe and created deeper geopolitical rifts. Now, it's unclear if the summit will actually end the war and deliver peace. Putin, of course, is the wild card in all of this, and he remains committed to bringing all of Ukraine under Russian rule. He's already stared down crippling sanctions and faced off against Europe's best. Clearly, the stick approach has not worked. What's to say the carrot will? And shifting focus to Africa, for a year now, Sudan has been in the grip of a fierce civil war. The country's military leadership has been warring, vying for power. And the conflict between General Boran's force, the Sudanese army, and that of his deputy has dragged on for months, 
with diplomatic efforts failing to put an end to the violence. But there's something now turning the tide in Sudan's civil war, Iranian drones. Our next report tells how Iranian drones are helping the Sudanese army gain ground and what's in it for Tehran. The resource-rich North African country of Sudan has been in the grip of a vicious power struggle for over three years now. The country's military leadership is at loggerheads. The two military men who were once on the same side and are now at the center of this dispute are General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, the head of the armed forces and in effect the country's president, and his deputy general Mohammad Hamdan Dagalo, also known as Hamedti, the head of the paramilitary rapid support force or the RSF. The war broke out in April last year in the capital city of Khartoum. The two factions imploded into street clashes. But one year into the civil war, the Sudanese army is regaining territory around Khartoum. Helping them turn the tide of the conflict are Iranian drones. Sudan's army has had access to Iranian Mohajir and Ababil drones. Reports say the Sudanese army had acquired Iranian-made drones in the past few months after older UAVs brought little success in rooting out the RSF fighters. The army has reportedly been using these advanced drones to monitor RSF movements, which forced them to flee from many areas. These Iranian drones were reportedly transported to Sudan late last year. Iran and Sudan shared strong ties under former President Omar al-Bashir. In 2016, Sudan's army had also developed Iranian drones under a joint military program. But later, in his three-decade rule, al-Bashir turned to Iran's Gulf rivals for economic support. This led to the end of Khartoum's cooperation with Tehran. The acting Sudanese government restored diplomatic cooperation with Iran last year, but official military cooperation was still pending. Turning to Iran now. What does Iran gain from support to the Sudanese army? Well, Sudan is a strategically located country. It lies on the coast of the Red Sea, which is a key area of competition between global powers. At a time when a war rages in the Middle East, the region becomes even more crucial for Iran. Iran-backed Houthis have been launching relentless attacks in support of Hamas. So, with support to Sudan, Iran could get a staging post on the African side of the Red Sea. Washington is asking other countries in the region to encourage Iran not to engage. We, we've had uh, numerous discussions with uh, uh, countries in the region, and in those discussions with countries in the region, we've encouraged them to encourage other countries like Iran uh, not to uh, not to engage. I won't get into uh, what discussions we may or may not have have had with uh, with Iran, but in our discussions with other countries in the region, we've also asked for their assistance in pressing each other as well as others to uh, stop fueling this uh, this war. For the people of Sudan, the last few years have been harrowing. There has been indiscriminate violence, bombings and killings. They shot and killed many of us and took all our belongings. They left us with absolutely nothing apart from the clothes on our backs. They took everything from our carts and all our food supplies. They didn't leave us anything. Moreover, the civil war has pushed millions into extreme hunger and to the edge of famine. The WHO says about 3.5 million children under the age of five have acute malnutrition. The war has created the world's largest displacement crisis. According to the UN, at least 8.2 million people of Sudan's 49 million population have fled their homes since the fighting broke out. Thousands are still fleeing the country in desperation. The solution is not a truce. It's a complete cessation of the war. People have been wronged and have had enough of war. Everyone has had enough of war. 
Due to the war, the government doesn't provide for us and we are suffering now. We used to get three sacks per acre, but now we only get one. It has also triggered waves of ethnic attacks and horrifying instances of sexual violence in the Darfur region. As the turmoil intensifies, humanitarian aid for Sudan is crucial but access remains limited in many areas. Diplomatic efforts have failed to put an end to the crisis. Several ceasefire agreements have been reached over the past year, but both sides have accused each other of continuing the fighting in each case. The question is, will Iranian drones now open a new chapter in Sudan's civil war? And finally, all iPhone users beware. Apple has issued a cyber attack alert for iPhone users in 92 countries. The tech giant says some of its users were possible victims of a mercenary spyware attack. It says that the hackers tried to remotely compromise the phones of its victims. So what are the mercenary cyber attacks and how can iPhone users not fall prey? Our next report goes into detail. Apple has a new cyber attack warning for its iPhone users. And according to reports, this one is extremely terrifying and advanced. Apple has issued an alert for its users in 92 countries about a potential mercenary spyware attack. It says hackers have tried to remotely compromise the iPhones of targeted victims. In its notification, the company said it has high confidence in the warning and users must take it seriously. So what are these mercenary attacks? First, hackers identify specific individuals and their devices, usually in very small numbers. Then they roll out the spyware that is sometimes distributed using a zero-click attack. This means that an iPhone user doesn't need to interact with the attack. Just a malicious image sent via iMessage or WhatsApp would do wonders for these hackers. Once the attack is successful, the hacker gets total control over the device. They can access everything on the phone's screen, read emails, listen to calls, and even use messaging apps. Apple says mercenary spyware attacks cost millions of dollars, and they often have a short shelf life, making them much harder to detect and prevent. The iPhone maker explains that these attacks don't hone in on average users to lift their bank account numbers or personal details. Instead, they target high-profile individuals such as politicians, diplomats, journalists and activists. Apple says these attacks are some of the most advanced digital threats, which is mainly due to their extreme cost, sophistication and worldwide spread. So how can iPhone users safeguard themselves from these mercenary attacks? Apple has asked its users to update their iPhones to the latest software, to use unique and strong passwords and to avoid clicking on suspicious links. However, it is assured that if these steps are followed repeatedly, then the vast majority of iPhone users will never become victims to such attacks. Most recently, Apple sent an email saying, hackers sought to remotely compromise iPhones associated with your Apple ID. Apple sends these kinds of notifications to its users multiple times a year to ensure that the iPhone users remain cautious about cyber attacks. So if you're an iPhone user, don't worry, Apple has your back. As long as you don't click on any unknown attachments and suspicious links. That's our show for today. We certainly thank you so much for tuning in. We hope to see you again right back here next week. Thanks so much for watching. From impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issues.
But above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Post America.